chapter 8. This is another chapter that's largely about mathematics. We had the reality of abstractions, which at least in part was about mathematics, and this one is a window on infinity. And in the window on infinity, we're really laying the groundwork for some of the material that is to come about the multiverse. So the motivation really is to speak about quantum theory and how to understand infinite sets and how to count them and otherwise measure their number. That's what all this is about. And we'll look at some really cool maths along the way, hence my whiteboard here. So let me just begin the reading rather than having a huge preamble as such as I did in the last episode and get straight into the book. David Wright, the beginning of chapter eight. Mathematicians realized centuries ago that it is possible to work consistently and usefully with infinity. Infinite sets, infinitely large quantities, and also infinitesimal quantities also make sense. Many of their properties are counterintuitive, and the introduction of theories about infinities has always been controversial. But many facts about finite things are just as counterintuitive. What Dawkins calls the argument from personal incredulity is no argument. It represents nothing but a preference for parochial misconceptions over universal truths. In physics too, infinity has been contemplated since antiquity. Euclidean space was infinite, and in any case, space is, was usually regarded as a continuum. Even a finite line was composed of infinitely many points. There were also infinitely many instants between any two times. But the understanding of continuous quantities was patchy and contradictory until Newton and Leibniz invented calculus, a technique for analysing continuous change in terms of infinite numbers of infinitesimal changes. The beginning of infinity, the possibility of the unlimited growth of knowledge in the future, depends on a number of other infinities. One of them is the universality in the laws of nature, which allows finite local symbols to apply to the whole of time and space and to all phenomena and all possible phenomena. Another is the existence of physical objects that are universal explainers, people, which it turns out are necessarily universal constructors as well and must contain universal classical computers. I'll pause there. This is my hobby horse, of course. Uh, a person is a universal classical computer, or as David says there, a person contains a universal classical computer. A person is a universal classical computer in the sense that they are that plus more. They have all the capacities that a universal classical computer has, but unlike the universal classical computers that, for example, I'm making this podcast and video upon, those computers cannot explain anything. They do not have the capacity for explanation, for learning. What we need in order for something to be designated a person is a system that not only is universal in its capacity to compute, but also university, universal in its capacity to explain. One, the universal capacity for explanation depends upon or has a prerequisite of universal computation, but not vice versa. A universal computer doesn't need to be a universal explainer. Let's continue with the book. The next paragraph says, most forms of universality themselves refer to some sort of infinity, although they can always be interpreted in terms of something being unlimited rather than actually infinite. This is what opponents of infinity call a potential infinity rather than a realized one. For instance, the beginning of infinity can be described either as a condition where progress in the future will be unbounded or as the condition where an infinite amount of progress will be made. But I use those concepts interchangeably because in this context there is no substantive difference between them. There is a philosophy of mathematics called finitism. So I won't read the next part. The next part is about the philosophical doctrine of finitism. I won't read that. Um, I, I would encourage people to go to the book for the full understanding of the problems with finitism. But suffice it to say here, the question is, if one rejects the reality of infinity, then one is forced in mathematics to conclude there must be a large, largest possible number. If you believe in finitism, or if you think finitism is true, then there are not infinite sets, including the infinite set of numbers, infinite set of integers, it must stop somewhere, so therefore there is an infinite, so therefore there is a finite number of numbers. However, in order to generate integers in the first place, what we do is we add one to any number that we currently do have. And so if the argument is there is a largest possible number, then we are contradicting the rule that in order to get to the next number, we add one. In other words, if someone comes up to you and says, if someone comes along and argues for finitism, then they are arguing for a largest possible number and they must be able to answer the question as to why that largest possible number, whatever it is, 
cannot have one added to it. So David spends a number of paragraphs criticising finitism, criticising finitism as unreasonable. And then he writes, the whole of the above discussion assumes the universality of reason. The reach of science has inherent limits. So does mathematics. So does every branch of philosophy. But if you believe that there are bounds on the domain in which reason is the proper arbiter of ideas, then you believe in unreason or the supernatural. Similarly, if you reject the infinite, you are stuck with the finite. And the finite is parochial. So there is no way of stopping there. The best explanation of anything eventually involves universality, and therefore infinity. The reach of explanations cannot be limited by fiat. And skipping just a little more, and David writes, Cantor founded the modern mathematical study of infinity. His principle was defended and further generalised in the 20th century by the mathematician John Conway, who whimsically, but appropriately, named it the Mathematician's Liberation Movement. As those defences suggest, Cantor's discoveries encountered vitriolic opposition among his contemporaries, including most math mathematicians of the day, and also many scientists, philosophers and theologians. Religious objections, ironically, were in effect based on the principle of mediocrity. They characterised attempts to understand and work with infinity as an encroachment on the prerogatives of God. In the mid-20th century, long after the study of infinity had become a routine part of mathematics and had found countless applications there, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein still contemptuously denounced it as meaningless, though eventually he also applied that accusation to the whole of philosophy, including his own work. See chapter 12. I'll pause there and uh, my commentary here. Wittgenstein again. Um, Yes, Wittgenstein and Popper had a great debate about whether or not there existed philosophical problems at all. Wittgenstein argued that there were not. There were only these things called philosophical puzzles, that every single philosophical problem was, was an apparent problem because of our misunderstanding of how to use language. So in other words, all philosophical problems came down to language games. So this is the... This is the phrase that many people even today, many philosophers today, still use. And Wittgenstein indeed said of his own philosophy that it was rather useless, like the rest of philosophy and the rest of metaphysics. What he said of his own philosophy was, it's kind of like a ladder that helps you to climb out of a dark well. And once you are out of the dark well, you can dispense with the ladder. And that's what he thought of his own philosophy, that it was this heroic thing that allowed people to get out and become enlightened. Now there's this wonderful book, it's called Wittgenstein's Poker, I don't have it here with me now, I'll put an image on the screen, um, it's sitting on my desk at my workplace actually, um, and it, it, Wittgenstein's Poker is about the sole encounter that ever happened between, between these two big names in philosophy, Wittgenstein and Popper, and this great debate about whether or not there were philosophical problems. It's called Wittgenstein's Poker because apparently during the debate, although accounts of what actually happened differ, Apparently, at some point, Wittgenstein picked up the poker out of the fireplace and pointed it at Popper in order to emphasise a point. So, uh, yes, but there's some debate about whether or not that happened. So it's an interesting sociological study of these um, two communities of philosophers or philosophies, as well as the debate itself. So I recommend this book. And I'll just say on the point, it's, it sounds like a very clever thing to say, and I, I, I think it is... Uh, one of the better things that possibly Wittgenstein did say, it is clever, um, that his own philosophy is kind of like a ladder out of, you know, from which you use to escape a well. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a great analogy, but ultimately it is a false analogy. It's a false analogy because you cannot escape from the problems of philosophy. The problems of philosophy are not like a well, <laughs> and the well is always there. You are forever climbing out of the well, and the ladder, I suppose, is useful. This is the philosophical progress that you're making, but it is an infinite climb. It is an infinite climb towards the light, if you like, which is an infinitely far distance off. So the, uh, I suppose the ladder analogy works, but you just can't get out of the well. That's the mistake that Wittgenstein made. Skipping a little more. And then David writes, in mathematics, infinity is studied via infinite sets, meaning sets with infinitely many members. The defining property of an infinite set is that some part of it has as many elements as the whole thing. For instance, think of the natural numbers. Now, I'll pause here and, and David goes through some examples. So I'll go through, I'll go through um, the example over here. Um, we've got 
the counting numbers here, I've added, I've added zero to, to the numbers. So we've got integer numbers. So starting at zero, we go one, two, three, four, okay, off to infinity. Now imagine we just take part of that set, just the even numbers, zero, two, four, six, eight. Well, it looks like this has half as many members, doesn't it? But in fact, it doesn't. It has exactly the same number of members. And the reason why is because for every single number that I can write in the first set, I can write a number in the second set. Now, I will never run out of numbers in the second set, even though it doesn't include all of the numbers that are in the first set. And so what we say is that they, these two sets are in one-to-one -one correspondence. For every member, we can write down another member in the other set. And so on, if we did the three times tables, three, six, nine, 12, etc. If you take part of this first set and write it down here, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence. And so therefore, the size of the infinity is the same. They're both infinitely long. We'll never get to the end, but we're going to see in a very short moment that there are kinds of infinity that are bigger than other kinds of infinity. And the first thing I'll preface it to say is, this one's a countable infinity. We can literally count it, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Or well, this one, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. Countable infinities. They're infinite, but they're not as big as other infinities that we're about to come to. Now, so far I've skipped a, a actual substantial bit of the beginning of this chapter, but now I'm going to read an extended bit of this chapter. I find it re it's really entertaining this part. Um, and so let me just get straight into it. David writes, the mathematician David Hilbert devised a thought experiment to illustrate some of the intuitions that one has to drop when reasoning about infinity. He imagined a hotel with infinitely many rooms, infinity hotel. The rooms are numbered with the natural numbers, starting with one and ending with what? The last room number is not infinity. First of all, there is no last room. The idea that any numbered set of rooms has a highest numbered member is the first intuition from everyday life we have to drop. Second, in any finite hotel whose rooms were numbered from one, there would be a number whose room equaled the total number of rooms and other rooms whose numbers were close to that. If there were 10 rooms, one of them would be room number 10 and there would be a room number nine as well. But infinity hotel, where the number of rooms is infinity, all the rooms have numbers infinitely far below infinity. Now imagine that infinity hotel is fully occupied. Each room contains one guest and cannot contain more. With finite hotels, fully occupied is the same thing as no room for more guests. But infinity hotel always has room for more. So I'll just pause there. So that's, a, that's another strange intuition. And it, it's kind of, it illuminates some of the struggle we have in trying to capture mathematical reality and mathematical truth in normal natural language like English. So again, he writes, if the hotel is fully occupied, in the case of a, of a finite hotel, fully occupied means there's no room for anyone else. That's what fully occupied means. But if you've got an infinitely large hotel, fully occupied means there's still room. That seems like a contradiction. It's not, and David's about to explain why, so let me continue reading. One of the conditions of staying there is that guests have to change rooms if asked by the management. So if a new guest arrives, the management just announced over the public address system, will all guests please move immediately to the room numbered one more than their current room? Thus, the existing occupant of room one moves to room two, whose occupant moves to room three, and so on. What happens at the last room? There is no last room, and hence no problem about what happens there. The new arrival can now move into room one. At Infinity Hotel, it is never necessary to make a reservation. Evidently, no such place as Infinity Hotel could exist in our universe because it violates several laws of physics. However, this is a mathematical thought experiment. So the only constraint on the imaginary laws of physics is that they be consistent. It is because of the requirement that they be consistent that they are counterintuitive. Intuitions about infinity are often illogical. I'll just pause there just to remark that we have to keep in mind throughout these thought experiments that Infinity Hotel is not of our universe. Infinity Hotel is an is in abstract space, so to speak. And so it can violate laws of physics. It does not obey our laws of physics. And this is absolutely crucial because it's going to eliminate something about our laws of physics. Okay, so let's keep on going. David writes, it is a bit awkward to have to keep changing rooms, though they are all identical and are freshly made up every time a guest moves in. But guests love staying in Infinity Hotel 
That's because it is cheap, only a dollar a night. Yet extraordinarily luxurious. How is that possible? Every day, when the management receive all the room rents of one dollar per room, they spend the income as follows. With the dollars they receive from the rooms numbered one to a thousand, they buy complimentary champagne, strawberries, housekeeping services, and all the other over overheads. Just for room number one. With the dollars they receive from the rooms numbered 1,001 to 2,000, they do the same for room two, and so on. In this way, each room receives several hundred dollars worth of goods and services every day, and the management make a profit as well, all from their income of one dollar per room. Word gets around, and one day an infinitely long train pulls up at the local station, containing infinitely many people wanting to stay at the hotel. Making infinitely many public address announcements will take too long. And anyway, the hotel rules say that each guest can be asked to perform only a finite number of actions per day. But no matter. The management merely announced, will all guests please move immediately to the room number that is double that of their current room? Obviously, they can all do that. And afterwards, the only occupied rooms are the even numbered ones, leaving the odd numbered ones free for the new arrivals. That is exactly enough to receive the infinitely many new guests because there are exactly as many odd numbers as there are natural numbers. And that's just as we can see here, of course, there's equally as many even numbers as there are natural numbers here, counting numbers, and there would be equally as many odd numbers as well. So if the person in room number one moves to two, the person in two moves to four, then we're left with room number one being free and room number three being free and so on. Okay, so in that thought experiment, we've had an infinitely long train turn up to Infinity Hotel that's packed to the brim with an infinite number of people that are still accommodated inside of the hotel. And the next thought experiment's even better. So David writes, then one day an infinite number of infinitely long trains arrive at the station, all full of guests for the hotel. But the managers are still unperturbed. They just make a slightly more complicated announcement, which readers who are familiar with mathematical terminology can see in the footnote. The upshot is, everyone is accommodated. So even an infinite number of infinitely long trains with an infinite number of people on each train can still be accommodated in an infinity hotel. Which is just to say, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between those two sets. The set of infinitely long trains, the infinite set of infinitely long trains, each of which have an infinite number of people in them, and the set of natural numbers here. But then David writes, however, it is mathematically possible to overwhelm the capacity of Infinity Hotel. In a remarkable series of discoveries in the 1870s, Cantor proved, among other things, that not all infinities are equal. In particular, the infinity of the continuum, the number of points in a finite line, which is the same as the number of points in the whole of space or space-time, is much larger than the infinity of the natural numbers. Cantor proved this by proving that there can be no one-to-one -one correspondence between the natural numbers and the points in a line. That set of points has a higher order of infinity than the set of natural numbers. And then David does an explanation of Cantor's diagonal argument. And I'm going to do a slightly different version here. It's, it's kind of the version that you will see if you just look up Cantor's diagonalization argument. Okay, so let's start again. Now, and and here we're going to use the binary system. In other words, just the numbers zero and one. So if we were to write down all the different permutations, the different ways in which we could write a, an infinitely long sequence of zeros and ones, let's see what we do. So maybe we could, if we were just gonna write, we could write just zeros, right? That would be an infinitely long sequence of nothing but zeros, boring, or an infinitely long sequence of just ones, okay? And now if we start to combine them, maybe we could do a, an alternating series of 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Or, or we, could, we could do the opposite, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Or maybe we could do two ones and a 0. Two ones and a 0. Or maybe two zeros and a 1. Two zeros and a 1. Or maybe it could be three ones and, a zero, and two zeros. Or one zero, or three zeros. Three ones, and two zeros. You can imagine all the different possible permutations of ways of writing zeros and ones. All the 
infinite, all the different kinds of infinitely long sequences of zeros and ones. Now it's at this point I realized my microphone had ceased working. And so we're going to have to continue this explanation in the very next episode where I can promise the audio is far better. Anyway, we'll see you then.